Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Emil Fombillon and I'm part of the team here at the Martini Institute. It's inspiring to bring Dr. Martini live to you today. Let's just give everyone a second to join. Please share in the comment sections um, on uh, where you are from. Um, it's always interest, interesting to see the diversity of the group that we've got with us today. The topic we are going to be um, discussing with Dr. Martini is the innovator's mindset for building wealth. Um, if you do have any questions related to this topic, please ask it in the comment section um, on the platform that you are on. Dr. Martini, are you there? I am, I am. Uh, welcome. Um, Dr. Martini. are you ready to go with the first question? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good afternoon, or whatever time it is, ever. <laughs> um, what is the innovator's mindset, and why does that allow one the opportunity to build wealth? Okay, those are two. I'll, I'll have to take those in two steps, and then we'll connect them. How's that? Perfect. Um, I define innovation, original thinking, creativity and even genius in a similar category. And I used to teach a course many years ago called Awakening to Genius Within. And I was very fascinated by that topic of creativity, creating original ideas. I've said to myself since I was in around 20 that I create original ideas that serve humanity. I create original ideas that serve humanity. And that's been sort of an internal dialogue that I wanted to do. But I found out that when you are challenged, you are innovative. When things are supportive and things are going your way and easy, things are easy, uh, you stay in your comfort zone. You stay in the status quo because it's working. You think, okay, it's working, no, no need to change. But when all of a sudden things challenge you, you have to come up with creative ideas and adapt. And it has been found that when you're pursuing challenges that are most inspiring to you when you're pursuing challenges that are most inspiring to you that's when you get the most innovation creativity genius etc genius is the pursuit of challenges that inspire you now some people have listened to me uh, talking about uh, living by highest priorities highest values I, I, there's no way i can do it justice to human behavior and maximizing your potential without it. Because when we live by priority, the highest value, we are pursuing something that's inspiring to us where we innovate. Children are playing video games, young boys and stuff that are playing video games. The second they conquer a video game, they wanna to go to the next level and go to the next challenging video game and tackle a bigger challenge. And that's when they're they like that challenge and they are innovative and creative and figure out how to solve that. And if they solve that, they wanna go into the next one. So it's a natural biological, psychological endeavor to go and pursue challenges that inspire you. And so you wanna make sure that you are, if you wanna maximize your innovation, your creativity, your genius, your original ideas, and not take in borrowed visions and ideas from other people, subordinating to them, and walk the path of the most innovative, creative genius you can be. It's sticking to priority and focusing on what is really, really, really most important to you and pursuing the challenges that you want to tackle. If you don't fill your day with challenges that inspire you, it fills up with challenges that don't. When you fill your day with challenges that inspire you, you have used stress. When you fill it with challenges that don't, you have distress. So giving yourself permission to go and pursue the challenges. And one of the greatest challenges you can do the greatest challenge you can do is filling the needs of service for people in ever larger scales. So if you find out the biggest problem that the world is facing or whatever one you feel you can contribute to and target that and go and try to solve that, you get the most innovative. And if you can create an answer, a solution to that problem uh, and do it more effectively and efficiently than somebody else out there, you have the capacity to earn the greatest wealth. Wealth is uh, an expression of sustainable, fair exchange with other people, solving their problems, filling their needs, answering their questions. So first pursue something that inspires you, but then look for challenges that the world is facing. And when you can tackle the challenges that the world is facing on ever greater scales, 
the bigger the problem you're able to solve, the more wealth you potentially you can have. Because wealth uh, is simply the accumulation of sustaining transactions with other people, filling their needs and getting paid for it and putting a portion of it into asset accumulation. That is financial wealth. And so I, I've uh, made a point to do that in my life. I made a point to take a portion of whatever I've earned um, and put it aside. Most people, without realizing the second they earn more, they spend more and they, they keep spending on, on lifestyle. And so they're living month to month all the time instead of setting a portion of a side and letting it compound and grow. Einstein said compound interest is one of her greatest, greatest gifts in the world. And it's true. It's an amazing thing what happens if you just are patient with it. If you, if you have immediate gratification, you can't see the long-term impact of, of compound interest. But if you can think of long-term compound interest, you can do amazing things. So pursuing challenges that inspire you, that fill great numbers of people's needs, the ever greater number, the greater, solving those problems, allowing you with sustainable fair exchange and, and taking a portion of that and setting aside and buying assets, real assets that put money in your pocket, not take money out that are consumables and depreciables, but real assets is the way how innovation can create wealth. And look at, look at Amazon, one of the wealthiest men in the world innovated something 20 years ago that uh, was way ahead of its time. And today, now there's millions of people using Amazon, million, just freaking billion people using Amazon because he had an innovative thought. I wonder what would happen if we sat down and instead of thinking about all of our problems and putting all this energy on the, what's going on in the news and these kind of things, and we just focused on actually what are the greatest problems that I would love to solve on the planet that could help the greatest number of people. Bill Gates asked the question on a regular basis, you know, how can I do today um, the most efficient, effective actions that serve the ever greater numbers of people, the greatest number of people with the resources that I have in a way that inspires me, inspires the people. And if you ask that question on a daily basis, look for solutions and problem solutions um, and go and implement those effectively and efficiently and competitively because you care, then um, man, wealth is yours and creativity is gonna be yours because creativity is gonna come out of solving those problems. And uh, Dr. Demartini, uh, Warren Buffett said we won't build wealth um, if we can't manage our emotions. What is your take on that statement? Well, it's uh, before I even knew about Warren Buffett, I could see the truth of that. So when I heard that from Warren Buffett, I went, boom, immediately that made sense because of two uh, complementary opposite polarities inside a human being. And I'm going to try to develop this uh, if I can. So uh, maybe you get a piece of paper out and, and draw this if you have it. If not, just kind of visualize it with me. I want you to imagine a, a line coming down from the top of the page down, about halfway down the page. And then I want you to imagine a, a line, a, a S-shaped line, a snake kind of line going like this, which you see me draw in my breakthrough experience and other programs. So I'll put it here like this. So, so on your left side, it's coming down, crossing over at the midpoint, and then going down. And I want you to imagine that this is pointing upward, and that's your proud, self-righteous, inflated, um, puffed up uh, persona that you wear. I mean, we all have moments where we puff ourselves up and think we're better than we are greater than we are, put greater sign there. This is the part where we're greater than we actually are. The, where the line crosses equally right there, at midpoint. That's where we are, our true self-worth. That's where we are really, that's our true self. Here we puff ourselves up. Over here, we, we, let me go there. Here we beat ourselves down. So we deflate ourselves, we get shamed, we minimize ourselves, we have a lesser than. Here we have a greater than, here we have a lesser than. <clears throat> So we have a pride <clears throat> and a shame, inflated and deflated, uh, you know, self-righteous, self-raunches, uh, puffed up, deflated. When we go and puff ourselves up, the moment we go above equilibrium, our true self is, which is equanimity, the moment we go above, <clears throat> we move in towards a narcissistic side. And then whenever we go below, we tend to go into an altruistic side. <clears throat> now, what does that mean? If you've done a transaction with somebody, you've done a service 
or pardon me, you've done a service and somebody's paid you. And you, in advance, you said, here's what the service is. Here's what the fee is. They pay you exactly at the day you give the service, the fee. <clears throat> and it's a completely closed transaction, completed transaction. And you got paid exactly what you wanted for the fee that they wanted. And it was a perfect exchange. You have what is called a sustainable fair exchange. And both parties are going to probably want to continue to go forward in the transaction. But it, when you get puffed up and you believe that you deserve more, that means that you have done more service and they didn't pay the full amount. So if you did the service and they didn't pay the full amount, what they agreed to, you get narcissistic and you demand more. I want something for nothing more because I've already given you the service. But if all of a sudden you've given the service, but you didn't give the service that was agreed to and they've already paid, you tend to go altruistic and feel like I need to owe them something. I need to give them more service. So when they, you feel that they didn't pay you the full amount, you get narcissistic. When you feel that you didn't give the full amount for what they paid, you go altruistic. Now, the human being, according to equity theory, has a built-in psychostat, thermostat, you might say, for high and low temperatures, it's trying to regulate it, get it back into the normal temperature, 72 degrees, let's say. So if you go high, you have a built-in part of you that, you know, if you get cocky, it's because you feel that you deserve something you haven't gotten. When you're an altruistic, you feel that like you have gotten something you didn't deserve and you minimize yourself. So both of these mechanisms tend to um, try to get something for nothing or try to give something for nothing because it's not a fair exchange. And is trying to get back into fair exchange. We have a natural, intuitive thermostat trying to get us into fair exchange because we know innately that that's where sustainable the relationships occur, whether it be in our relationship at home, our kids, our business, our work, our clients. Equity theory shows this. Now, anytime we're doing a transaction and we feel that we got short change, we're going to get narcissistic. Anytime we feel that we, we have short change others, then we get altruistic. Altruistic, we want to give away. <clears throat> Narcissists, we want to get something. So narcissists, we want to get something for nothing. Altruists, we want to give something for nothing. Now, let's take those two personas. <clears throat> Pardon me. Let's take those two personas and let's stick them on top of money management. And, and, and just look at what happens here. And this happens across the board every time we have a credit cycle. Credit cycle is about a seven to 11 year period of banking credit. So what happens is the market, when the stock market or real estate market or any investment market goes up, it goes up and down every seven to 10, 11 years. <clears throat> and it goes up when you borrow money, people get exuberant, they go out and spend their money. And then they go out and they go, oh crap, now I've got debt. And then, so there's a cycle where they're elated and then there's a cycle when they're depressed having to pay the debt. So this cycle goes like that. And when, when the businesses are up, uh, people get exuberant, irrational, emotional, and they start getting optimistic. When they do, they tend to think, well, the market is going up. And once the market goes up, whatever the type of investment market goes up, uh, higher than the cost of money, people will borrow money to put in the market to make money off money and use other people's money. And they'll get narcissistic and want to get something, a return off nothing. It's the same psychology. So when there's an, ir an irrational exuberance going on and there's a manic phase of a market cycle and people do it in, in 2000, 2000, 36% of the entire NASDAQ market <laughs> was borrowed money. It was a house of cards. People were exuberant because they were getting double digit returns. And then all of a sudden they're now borrowing money because they, they can borrow money at 6% and go get 10, 12% and just borrowing a million dollars and stick it in here and making $400,000 in six months. So they're thinking, oh man, I'm, and they start getting puffed up even further and they get into an irrational exuberance and they start to think, well, I'll, I'll borrow more money. But once it goes above the mean, here's the mean. And once it goes above the mean, it corrects and the credit cycle comes. <clears throat> But by the time they do it, they're blind. When they're manic, they're blind to the downsides. They borrowed money. And then when it goes down, the banks demand their money. And they're, they called on the loans. And the people have lost money. 
And so they learn that, well, I got emotional and I let my emotions run me and I borrowed money and now I'm in debt and now I got to pay it back and the whole thing's crashed and I got to pay back. Now I'm in debt. And this is because we got emotional. On the other side, when they go down and they, they get uh, altruistic, what they do is they want to sell because they don't want to lose their money and then they sell at the bottom and then they give their money away undervalued and the altruistic side comes out. And if they have really got hit on both of those, um, they are double whammy and they stay out of the market because they think that's too crazy. When in fact, the reason they did that is because they were not living according to their highest values. They were in their amygdala going into extreme emotions. They were not focused on what was really priority, long-term investments. They were not buying assets based on the mean, which is the real price of the asset, the real value of the asset. They were exaggerating themselves and then minimizing themselves, which means they have emotions. <clears throat> and people that exaggerate themselves borrow money and get themselves in debt. And people that are, that are minimizing themselves sell out at the bottom to get cash because they're desperate. And both of those people lose money. And that's why the person who's objective and stays on the mean and thinks long term is the investor. The rest of them are speculators speculating on the market. And I don't recommend speculation. I recommend consistent, long-term visionary investing. And that requires that you live by highest values. You serve the people's highest values. You do it in a sustainable, fair exchange. You understand the mean. You don't try to get something for nothing or give something for nothing, which is non-sustainable. And um, you take it and you keep buying true assets, which are companies that really serve people over long-term. Southwest Airlines was a company that... Um, was less likely to get a, a rationally exuberant. A lot of the airlines get expand and expand and then they contract and expand and contract through the market cycle. Southwest Airlines made sure they didn't go up too high and didn't go too low and kept vast cash reserves. I tell people that by keeping cash reserves, you reduce the emotional volatilities, you keep your strategies, you think long-term. And then if you have cash reserves, if there is occasional crash every seven to 10 years, you have cash for the crash and you end up on top. And I've been telling that, Sir, Sir John Templeton said the same thing, Buffett has said the same thing, Benjamin Graham said the thing, Philip Carrot said the things. All the great minds that were real investors understood this. So emotions destroy wealth, that's why Warren Buffett said that, and long-term strategies build it. The executive center is the center for long-term strategies. It has foresight, it has strategic planning, it has vision. The amygdala is an immediate gratifying desire center, trying to avoid predator, seek prey, and that's where you speculate. And people that can't get out of their amygdala are addictive and they want to quickly fix and they follow the herd. When you're living by the amygdala, you follow the herd. When you live by your executive center, you lead the herd. I'd much rather lead the herd and I do that and I've become wealthy because I've led the herd instead of followed the herd. And I follow basic principles that are stood the test of time. So until you can manage emotions, don't expect to manage money. One of the things that I teach in the breakthrough experience is how to manage emotions. And people think, well, how's that going to help my life? <laughs> well, in your brain, your mind will not have creative genius unless it's pursuing what's highest on its value objectively and looking for it. Because when you're in emotions, you don't think about solving problems. You're thinking about reacting to outside circumstances. So you lose your mental capacities when you're not living by highest priorities. In business, the same thing. You get exuberant. And then you get cocky and then you, you get blind to the downsides and get blind in the business and then get hit. <clears throat> or you go on the other side, you get altruistic and sacrifice and give away your profits. So all areas of life are impacted by those emotions. That's why in Breakthrough, I'm, I'm attempting to give people a tool, a science, the method, Demartini method, to help them empower all seven areas without them realizing it may be up, up front. But I'm giving them a tool that's a goldmine to help them master all those areas with one action. And I and I, I could go for hours on on the significance of that mastery, but people want a quick fix. Sometimes they want to, they want immediate gratification, and that is the thing that undermines relationships, the brain, uh, it, 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 the whole area, all areas of our life are undermined by immediate gratification. And I've worked with people in consulting and in breaks and and in other seminars with so many people who just have so much difficulty breaking their addiction to these immediate gratifications and these highs. And then anytime you see a high without a low or a low without a high, your brain polarizes the mind 
and it makes you think you can get one side without the other. You can't. It is impossible to divide the mind up except in your elusiveness. When you're illusioned into thinking you can get a high without a low or a low without a high, it feeds your delusion and makes you think you can get it. And therefore it makes you impulsively seeking one sidedness and trying to avoid the other. The wise individual is objective. The wise individual understands the homeostasis. The wise individual understands brain physiology and knows to go after long-term strategic vision. It's the old tortoise and the hare. And the, the tortoise that stays along just methodical and the hare is going all over the place. And eventually the tortoise wins the race. And I think that um, getting rich methodically is much wiser than gambling and having rise and falls. I, I teach people to go and lead and read about Jesse Livermore. Jesse Livermore was the wealthiest and the poorest and the wealthiest and the poorest and the wealthiest and poorest and eventually suicided himself um, trying to get rich quick. And I, and I think it's because of emotions. So I hope I've answered that question. I, that, that, that was great. Thanks, Dr. Martini. And then um, what you've seen over the years, um, what are the internal blocks um, to building wealth in your opinion? Well, besides the ones I just mentioned, yes. uh, you know, I, I, I find that many people, when they say they want to be financially independent, they're not doing what it takes. I've, I've said before on some of my other presentations, there are 10 steps that if you don't know those 10 answers to the 10 questions of financial independence, you don't have any intention of being financially independent. So the one they don't have, they don't take the time to plan out and put together a financial plan and a strategy and stick to it. And it is not rocket science. I've helped thousands of people rebuild their wealth after calamities or start from scratch young people and build their wealth. And the ones who have followed my simple old fashioned approach and never stopped are the ones that are becoming wealthy. And the people that wanna gamble all the time, they rise and then they, they're, they're proud and then they crash. They have these events occur and, they're, and it's just a rocket and, and uh, up and down and up and down and stuff. And I, I'm absolutely certain that, that there's a step-by-step -step methodical strategy to building wealth that is so simple that anybody listening to this can do it. And they, they're, it's just a matter of they do, if they have the values to do it. If you don't have a value on buying assets, financial independence is not going to happen. Your hierarchy of values dictate your financial destiny. And if you don't have a value on building wealth, and a value on serving people and having fair exchange, like the things I've been saying, and you don't have a value on mastering your mind. If you're not studying wealth, you're not building cushions, you're not stabilizing your emotions, the probability of you being financially independent goes way down. I'm not saying you couldn't, you might have circumstances where you get inheritance and these kind of things, but, but methodical, consistent wealth building is, takes a strategy. And there are gimmicks. I am amazed at the gimmicks on the market, feeding the fantasies of the people who want the lifestyle, the rich and famous overnight. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll do an advertising on that, have that ship, that yacht, and have that big penthouse and have that pot of gold and have that. And they, they feed the fantasies and sell the quick get rich schemes to people that are desperate in their amygdala instead of being proactive strategy patient, building long-term compound interest and building wealth. And um, I, I, I watch the people that go off on the tangents and I watch the people that stay steady and the, stay, the people that stay steady year by year, they can see a progression and it keeps getting bigger and bigger every year. And all of a sudden they realize that there's a crescendo to their wealth building instead of a, a rise and fall roller coaster. So managing your emotions is one. So having a strategy is two, having a high value on wealth building and not bullshitting yourself, not thinking it is. And the way you know that is you are actually building wealth. If you have no assets accumulated, you don't have a value in wealth building or you would have assets accumulated because you'd be doing it. So if you don't have it, then there, there needs to be a change in values if you want to get uh, wealthy. And then you need to have some sort of structure that has no emotion in it. One of the greatest things we have that I've been using now for 38 going on 39 years is automated 
savings and investment structures. They're automated. There's no emotion in it. It takes it out of my bank account and sticks it into my investments. And it does it automatically on a certain day and that you schedule and it's just done. And there's no emotion about it and there's no turning back and it just happens. And it's an unexpected bill that goes into investing. That's one of the greatest things I ever learned to do. 39 years ago when I started doing that, my, my financial life changed. So it's, it's consistently accelerating the, the willingness to, to reward yourself for services rendered and then the commitment to go serve people and then taking portions of it and ever greater proportions of that makes you more efficient in your business. And it's about a strategy. There's no motion. Money circulates to the economy from those who value at least to those who value at most, from those who have the least order and uh, you might say certainty about it to those who have the most. And whoever has the most certainty, I have absolute certainty that every week money's going into those investments and every week it's gonna grow and I know what it's gonna do. I don't have to question it. And I go out and serve people. My job is to serve people. That automation, its job is to make sure that I end up being rewarded for it. And when I put that in place, and if you do that, your life changes. But it's not about emotions, it's about certainty. And when you're infatuated or resentful, you never have certainty. If, if I said to you, you're always up, and you're never down, or you're always down and never up, you would never have certainty about that because you go, no, that's not true. But if I said, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, and, and you have a little of both, you go, yes. You only have certainty when you have objectivity and when you stick to the mean. And you get to a strategy with a mean up front. So putting those in place is as essential for, for building wealth and putting a strategy in place. And it's, again, not rocket science. I guarantee I can show people. I've, I've shown people how to do it in such a short period of time. I've, I've actually had clients that have gone with me over to the financial institution, had them sign a piece of paper, two pieces of paper. That's it. Two pieces of paper to have it automated from their bank account. Give them the bank account number. And they've automated a savings, just like they have unexpected bills. Now they have an automated savings. And then once they reach a certain threshold, it goes into investments and buying a certain side type of investments. And I set it up. They signed the piece of paper. I said, now go serve people and forget about it. Done. It's over with. Go serve people. Stack up the benefits of doing that and keep going more efficiently at serving and watch what happens. And people go, a year later, they go, well, I've more, saved more this year than I've ever saved in my life. Great. And two years later, now it's compounding. It's made me an extra two thousand dollars this year. Great. A year later, it's, it's made me five thousand dollars this year. Great. It may be a twelve thousand dollars this year. Next year, it's maybe twenty-eight thousand dollars. It just keeps compounding. They keep adding. It keeps growing. All of a sudden, they go, "Man, I'm I'm almost making for my investments what I was working." And I said, "Great. That's what the purpose of it is: not to be its slave, to be its master." And that's this is where you have emotions. This is where you're stabilizing your life. This is where you're frustrated having to go to work. Here's when you get to do something you love to do it, not because you have to, but because you love to. This is, this is the purpose of it. And to master that is, is essential. And the breakthrough experience, that's what I teach people, the, the, the mastery of the method that leads to that outcome. And it's showing you the strategy. It's not that hard. People make it very difficult. You know what's interesting? Pardon me, Emil, but Wall Street has been lying to people for decades. And I mean decades, century. 120 years I've been lying to people that it's complex to get you to offload money to them so they can mismanage your money and make money off you. Wall Street was made for the brokers to make you broke. They weren't meant for you. You must educate yourself, value yourself, value the service you give, value people to give the service and value wealth building if you want it to work for you. There's no, there's no shortcuts. You do that, your life changes financially. And your emotions are the absolute key foundation of that. If you can't manage emotions, you undermine it right off the bat. So that's right. Everything we can do to reduce emotions, if you have to wait to see if you can afford to save instead of having automated, you're going to get emotional about it. I don't know. I can do it this week. I can't do it this month. I'll pass. And you won't have a habit. It's the habit of doing it that matters. And that's why electronically it's done. It changes your behavior because you develop a habit electronically. And uh, Dr. D. Martini, how do we increase our deserve level um, and see ourselves deserving, um, deserving of vast wealth? Well, every single thing that you've ever done in your life, that if we were to film and put on camera on worldwide news, that you would not want anybody to know about, that you would feel ashamed of, guilty about, or feel humbled by, or humiliated by, I would make a list of those things. In other words, everything, when you're private or public, 
anything that you would not want anybody to see and do or know, you're judging about yourself. And that judgment of yourself that is shamed or guilted or feeling you made a mistake or whatever, most of those come from your comparison to other people's values. You never make a mistake in your own values. You made the decision based on those values. You only perceive yourself making a mistake when you subordinate to outside authorities. In the Breakthrough Experience, I teach people how to dissolve the subordination to outside authorities. That is one of the most significant things that undermine greatness is the subordination to outer authorities. Being respectful to people is one thing, but subordinating to them and offloading responsibilities that you are designed to have onto other people for how to think and how to live and how to what the morals and the, everything else is absolute hypocrisy and, and self, self depreciating. Anytime you're a cat trying to swim like a fish, you're going to beat yourself up. Anytime you're trying to live in somebody else's values, you're not going to you're not going to do anything except self depreciate. And anytime you think you're supposed to live by the superego, as Freud said, by the other values of the elder authorities, you're going to beat yourself up when you can't sustain it because you are only sustainable in your own highest values. So anytime you set a goal that's not in line with your highest values, you're going to have an unsustainable self-depreciation. And all of those self-depreciations devalue you and make you feel unworthy of receiving wealth. So it's extremely, extremely important to take a list of every single thing. And I mean, while you're private or public, anything you've ever done in your life that if all of a sudden it was watched, videoed, private or public, and you know what I'm talking about, put it and make a list of everything you would not want anybody to see. Anything that you feel humble by. And then take that item by item <clears throat> and ask how specifically did this action serve whoever I feel guilty or ashamed relative to? So if you feel you did something that you feel ashamed about, and it would be, oh, if my parents saw that, oh my God, I feel terrible. Oh, if my people or my friends saw that, oh, I feel bad or if God saw that, or whatever, your anthropomorphic deity that you make up in your mind, whoever and whatever you would perceive that if they saw that, you'd feel humiliated. Find out how it served those people and that entity in your mind and find out how it serves them. Because if you don't see how it serves them, you're going to self-depreciate. And the number one thing that keeps people from receiving it and holding on to money and valuing themselves and not wanting to give it away through consumerism or devalue themselves uh, when it comes to transactions is shame, shame and guilt. Number one thing, Foster Hibbard found that. He worked with Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill, Foster Hibbard, myself. I used to lecture with Foster Hibbard in the 80s, early 80s. And we, we were basically describing that same thing. They saw that. And uh, he said that the solution was doing altruistic acts until it's compensated for. I see, no, no. The altruistic acts are still a result of the shame. We got to dissolve the shame. Well, how do you dissolve the shame? By finding out most of the shame that you have in your life and the guilt you have in your life is the assumption that what you've done with your actions has caused more pain and pleasure, more loss and gain, more negative than positive, more uh, drawbacks and advantages or whatever to somebody. And that's just not the case. In the breakthrough experience, I've, I've seen thousands of people dissolve their shame. In fact, we have a column four and a column 11 for dissolving prides and shames in the program. And people, when I go there, how many of you just dissolve some shame they've been carrying around for weeks, months, decades, et cetera, and they all put their hands up, show them how to dissolve it. And that they don't realize it in that moment while they're doing that in the breakthrough experience, that they're actually now increasing the probability of them moving forward in wealth. The, every single one of those shames and guilts that they clear increases the probability of saying value enough to say, I deserve now, because they devalued themselves and I don't deserve. And they don't realize it's on a, on, on a subconscious level that I don't deserve, I don't deserve. And the way you know you don't deserve is you'll buy consumable items to make you feel better about yourself by paying overpriced prices for a brand that's transiently useful that impresses somebody out there that don't give a crap. And then you end up blowing it. And then you end up with a credit card debt and then you self depreciate. So now you get the high and then you get the low and then you self depreciate instead of building your own brand that you're inspired by that makes a difference in the world with fair exchange. Then you have wealth. So self depreciation of shame and guilt and clearing that, which I explained in the breakthrough experience, is very, very powerful in helping a person build their wealth. But it's not only that, it, it affects your relationships because some people don't feel worthy of being in a relationship. I've, I've counseled hundreds and hundreds of people that basically say, well, I'm in a relationship and I'm all enamored with him, but what happens if I find out that I'm, I've got these problems? You know, then he'll leave me or she'll leave me. Well, that's your own self-image. Until you value, you don't expect anybody else to. 
you clear that and then you stand up and then you realize, yes, I have some strengths and weaknesses in there based on my values, but I have something of value to the world. So if you want to stand and be strong in your self-worth and not be volatile in your self-esteem, so you have pseudo elevated self-esteem and pseudo depressed self-esteem and all of them together, wove together in a blender makes self-worth. If you want to raise your self-worth, come and learn that method and the Demartini method so I can show you how to do that in the breakthrough experience because there's absolutely no reason why you have to beat yourself up about some or puff yourself up. And if you're addicted to puffing yourself up and being proud, your brain has to set up automatically self-depreciating things to get you back in equilibrium. The whole thing that's going on in your psychology is trying to get you at the true self-worth. And at the true self-worth, that's where you have the most sustainable, fair exchange and transactions. When we get emotional, we tend to distort our transactions. And then we wonder why they're not lasting. It's because we get the feedback from it that we either try to get something for nothing or try to give something for nothing. If we try to get something for nothing, nobody wants to do business with us. If we try to give something nothing, we don't want to do business with them. None of those are sustainables. But when we have fair exchange, when we're objective and we're living by our highest values and we're not having those emotional baggage, baggages, we have tra trans transactions at work and they sustain. So that's the, that's the key to it. That's the thing to it is that's why mastering your knowing what your values are, knowing your highest values, sticking to priority, finding out what problems you want to solve that inspire you are, are essential components of wealth building. And Dr. Martini, you talk about the magnitude of vision um, determining what you can achieve in life. Can you elaborate on that relation to um, building wealth? Well, every time you live by your highest value and you tend to walk your talk, you tend to be disciplined, reliable, and focused. You tend to uh, be more objective, which means you'll embrace pain and pleasure in the pursuit of a goal, a real objective, and you tend to achieve it, you tend to want to achieve ever greater uh, achievements. So every time you live by your, your highest priority, you tend to expand. And what that means is you tend to expand things in space. You want to do something bigger and you want to do something that you can endure longer. Your patience goes up. So every time you do something that's high in your value and you achieve something, you tend to go to more unachievables. You tend to grow greater and greater things that eventually get greater space and time horizons until the space and the time horizons goes beyond your mortal form. And you start thinking of goals that go beyond your life and, and objectives that go beyond your immediate space, local environment. You go non-local and you go uh, non-timeful. You go beyond that. And this is how you wake up the immortal legacies. This, this is how you create uh, perpetuity and investment legends. This is how you create uh, legacies. So every time you live by high priority, your space and time horizons will grow. And once the space and time horizons go beyond your own lifespan, say 100 years, you're on your way to creating an immortal legacy. Immortal legacy is something that outlives your own for mortal life. And so that's you, you're not going to outgrow that vision you have. I've said before that if your vision is is a you know, community vision, you'll probably make a difference in yourself or your family. If you have a vision as big as your city, you'll make a difference in your, your community. If you have a vision as big as your state, you'll make a vision, you'll make a leadership role in the city. I watched it in my own life. I was um, probably one of the few people in when my profession, when I graduated, that were already thinking globally. And uh, when I opened up my office, I put clocks from around the world, all the major cities in there. I put a map in my office. And I started putting pins in the map on where all my patients are coming from. I put in white pins on where I wanted them to from, and then different colored pins from different nations when they were starting to come in. I positioned myself next to about 14, within a mile of us, there's 14 hotel complexes. So I went to all the hotels and introduced mine, gave cards out to the people at the front desk and let them know about my services. I started to visualize that. I had a globe in my office that I spin around a, a you know, this big globe thing that spun around on a thing that I could see the world. I always looked outside the world from an astronomical view, a celestial view that landed on the planet and envisioned the globe as mine. I've said to myself, I'm the universe, the universe is my playground, the world is my home, every country is a room in the house, every city is a platform to share my heart and soul. And now I live for the last 20 years almost on a, on a ship called the world that goes around the world. So I've started out from an astronomical perspective and a global view I've studied astronomy, cosmology. I'm writing another book on astronomy right now. And I'm constantly thinking outside the box and looking down on the earth as if it's just a play toy. The earth is an infinitesimal for an infinite vision. 
And so if you, your vision is small, you're not going to outgrow it. You got to have a bigger vision to be able to grow. You know, and we've got Elon Musk that's out there that's going on. He's headed for Mars. He's just got to the space station. He'll go to the moon soon and then he'll go on to Mars. So there's a visionary and he's one of the wealthiest people. He just converted his real estate holdings wisely into a different type of investment finally, because he's being smart there because those things are sinkholes most of the time. Lifestyle is a sinkhole compared to a real investment. A real estate investment is different. And even those right now are a bit uh, shaky with what's going on with Corona, but I wanna buy companies that serve people that serve no matter what the environment and get assets and, and expand your vision of what you can do and reach people and serve people. There's something fulfilling in knowing you're serving people. Buying companies and buying stocks in companies that are serving people or building companies that serve people is fulfilling. And, the, and if you have a global vision, then you, there's nothing stopping you from having a global result. And I, I, I'm absolutely certain it's doable because I've been doing it for many years. I've been to 154 countries to speak. I've taught the breakthrough experience in 65 of those countries. So I'm absolutely certain that you can have that. It's just got to be willing to work towards it. And, and if you give yourself permission to play on a global scale, it's yours. And I watched when I was in school. Most people did not even think outside the box. They thought of a little a community and they have a little thing and they serve it and then they struggle. If that community's down, they're, they're down. You have a global view. There's always some place in the world that's doing well and you just open up there. Give yourself permission to play. And I think that it's uh, essential if you want to grow a fortune and also grow influence. All seven areas of your life, you're wanting to expand whether you're conscious of it or not. And everybody is wanting to mate with somebody that's got the best package in all those seven areas. So if you, why would you expect to get the greatest mate um, if you're not giving the greatest date, <laughs> if you're not giving something really amazing in the, in the package, don't expect amazing package back. So you settle for something less uh, because you're basically devaluing yourself by playing small. And, uh, and, and I'm not saying that it's bad. It's not a moral issue. It's just that inside you, you have an innate yearning to expand. Nobody gets up and says, I want to be less intelligent and get rid of all my knowledge. No one gets up and says, I want to have a less powerful company. I want to have served less people and have less influence there. No one says I want to have less money. No one says I want to have less fulfillment in relationship, less social influence, less vitality and health, less spiritual awareness. No, we have a yearning automatically to expand and to study the mysteries and go into the greater vista of the mysteries around us. So it's your natural, it's, it's your nature and innate within you to continue to expand. And I'm interested in helping people do that. That's what the breakthrough experience for is breaking through the boundary wherever you are and going to the next one. And then breaking through that again, the, the tools that I share in that program teach you how to break through barrier by barrier by barrier. So you just keep going and then you can go as far as you want. And there's no right and wrong. If you, if you want to play small, great. But I doubt that that's what you want because I've I had people that say, well, I don't want all that. I was in Hawaii one time. I was doing the breakthrough experience in a, in a polit political politician's house, big house there. And uh, he said, well, I've got everything I want. I got, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. I don't have any new desires, anything like that. And the wife came out of the kitchen and hit him with a rag across his face and said, what kind of lie is that? You're bitching about this. You're bitching about this. You want this. You want this. Why are you putting on this facade for these people? She nailed him. That's what the purpose of the spouse is for, to make you authentic. And he goes, okay, okay, okay. So quit bitching and listen to the guy and tell him what you want so we can get somewhere. Because there's, when people say, I don't really want anymore, it's because they've hit a plateau and they don't see a way past their own obstacles. And then they justify it to feel comfortable and they live in a quiet life of desperation. But I'm absolutely certain that there's nothing inside a human being that wants to play small. They want to play, they want to expand. They want to grow in all areas of life. And there's a science to doing it. And there's no reason why you can't uh, continue to expand it. Maybe you don't want to do a Elon Musk or something. Maybe you'd love to raise a beautiful family in a, in a city. But even so, you want those kids to do something amazing with your life. You don't want them to just be a nobody. You want them to be somebody. And, and what they have and do and be uh, is, is fulfilling to watch them expand and do it. When you see somebody do extraordinary things, you get inspired. Well, that's because the part of you is wanting to do the same. So give yourself permission to, to expand, not shrink. To radiate, not gravitate. And uh, Dr. Martini, you talk about the riches within. What do you mean by that? And how does that relate to developing a mindset for wealth? So everybody has what is called genuine wealth. And genuine wealth can show up in any of the seven primary areas of life. I have intellectual property. I have knowledge that I've packaged 
and convert it into financial wealth. But if I didn't package it and put it into financial wealth, it would be intellectual property. And that's a form of wealth. It's a storage of wealth, but it's not financial until it's packaged and converted into finances. Some people also have business savvy and they have a massive business, but unless they sell it, they don't have financial wealth. Some people have a great business and then they sell it and they get millions. But while they have it, it's just sitting there and it's in a business form. When they sell it, they have financial cash. Sometimes they have a business with financial cash, which is wise, but some wait until they, they don't do anything until they sell it and they have an exit strategy and then they have a lot of cash. Some people have financial wealth. And they just consistently methodically build financial wealth. Some people have relationship wealth. If you were to go up to them and said, I'll give your a million dollars to your kid, they go, no way, except when they're 14 to maybe 17, 18. And you might say, take them, it won't cost anything. But at the process of doing it, there's kids and they're, they're so valuable to them. They'd say, you could pay me 10 million, 50 million, and I still wouldn't give up my kids. Maybe for a billion, I might, but for 50 million, no. So they have their wealth stored in their relationship with their family. You have others that are socially connected and know a lot of people and can convert that and negotiate and, and liaison with people and do deals. And because of who they know, they say, well, if, if you do business with this guy, I want to cut. And you got social wealth by the people you know. And you can do that. Some people use it as leverage. Trump puts his name on a building and it used to go up. I'm not, not sure what now, but it was. And so, you know, what a, a brand name has a value. Then you also have physical health. You have some people that are extremely attractive. I, I know a lady that uh, would not even go out on a date unless she paid her a half a million dollars. And she got it. Billionaires would line up to go out with date on this girl because she was stunning. And she get a half a million dollars just to go on a date. That's not even for sex. That's not a, 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 you know, a call girl. That's not a escort of anything. That's just a date. Because she valued her beauty and knew she had that power and took advantage of it. And why not? She made millions of dollars just going out on dates. Why not? And that is for a dinner. If you get a half a million dollars to go to dinner with somebody, you'd probably do it. As long as they're not psycho or something or control freaks, you'd probably do it. If, if I thought I could put on a date and I'd have for a half a million dollars, I'd probably go on a date too. But um, my, my, uh, I think people would pay me not to go on a date probably. But the point is that then there's also people that have spiritual wealth. And Shishi Ravi Shankar is a billionaire, has a, the, you know, the Art of Living Foundation. He teaches spiritual principles and he has spiritual wisdom that people want. Okay, so there's wealth in all seven areas. But that form of wealth will not be converted into financial wealth unless you have a higher value on financial wealth that the other ones can convert to by asking how specifically can my social connections help me be turned into fat cash. And then when you do, you create a company. I, I helped a lady go from 45,000 to 700,000 in one year in income by converting all of her social contacts into deal making and put together paperwork so that if they do deals with the people that she made contacts with that she gets a cut out of it or a percentage or a finder's fee. She never did that before. The moment she did that, her, her income went from 45,000 to 700,000 because she made some deals with some oil companies here in Houston and made a fortune. So she was sitting on a gold mine, didn't see it. Everyone out there right now, you're sitting on a gold mine and you may not be seeing it. And it's in one of those seven or more than one of those seven areas. I try to grow, develop them in all areas. So I empower all of them. So they're all in a convertible into cash. And, uh, and if you do, then you can master the ability to convert those. In my Where's My Billion program, I explain how to convert those and how to turn that into cash flow. Because there's a tremendous amount of intellectual property and ideas and people. And there's a lot of assets you have sitting there, but you may not be sitting in a way that they're turned into cash flow. So in the breakthrough experience, I show you how to have the self-worth, how to dissolve the emotions, how to think by not subordinating. So you have a, you're ready in the mindset for the wealth, but still you need to come in there and come up with a strategy, set it up, structure it, and make sure you look for hidden assets and convert them into real assets that are financially viable. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. D. Martini. And for those of you that's uh, joining us uh, live on this uh, live presentation, I'm sure you could uh, see Dr. D. Martini can definitely help you with um, to help you to see where your unique wealth is. Now, I could, I'm sure you could also see um, or you got a few insights um, with um, what you can implement immediately um, with what you've heard today. If you'd like to continue uh, your studies with Dr. D. Martini, we have put together a great offer for you to be able to attend the Breakthrough Experience online with Dr. D. Martini. So you'll see um, the, it's going to come up now on your screen. 
um, what we've put together. Um, Dr. Martini, can you explain a bit more what um, they can get out of attending the Breakthrough Experience uh, for you? And who is the Breakthrough Experience for and who is it not for? Well, the Breakthrough Experience, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's what I've been, I mentioned it through the program. But, but the, the Breakthrough Experience is my signature program that I've done 1,100 times now. I presented it that many times. And I've done it over 31, going on 32 years now. And it's where I basically do everything I can to help individuals break through their, their, their psychological boundaries that are stopping them from moving forward in the empowerment of the seven areas of life. And I'm, what I'm interested in doing is making sure that you don't subordinate to outer authority so you basically become an unborrowed visionary from within. Show you how to expand your vision show you how to take any emotion that you may be distracted by that's in your amygdala, impulses, instincts, um, things that are infatuations, resentments, all the distractions, pride, shame, all the things we were talking about that undermine the mastery of life and show you how to turn those by one method, turn those into gratitude, love, inspiration, enthusiasm, certainty, and presence, which I call the six uh, transcendental feelings that maximize performance. I show people how to not subordinate, as I said, and how to own the traits of the greats. That's one of the most powerful little tools that I can give people. I've seen people in sports and in movie and in the celebrity industry. I've seen people in business. I've seen people in wealth go to a new level because of following that one step, that step exercise. Doing the Demartini method allows you to dissolve baggage that you've been carrying around about yourself or about other people that's distracting. Because anything you infatuate with, resent, or have pride or shame about, Occupy space and time in your mind and runs you. I show you how to dissolve that. I show you how to set real objectives instead of fantasies for goals. Because if you set a fantasy, you're going to beat yourself up. Your brain is automatically designed to self-depreciate when you set up a fantasy and appreciate the second you set up a real objective. What's the distinction? How do you make a difference? How do you prioritize it? How to determine your values? How to structure your life according to values? How to set goals according to high values? how to increase the probability of achievement, how to expand space and time horizons, how to wake up your leadership capacities, how to build, build momentum in achievements, how to basically get the executive center functioning instead of your amygdala, and how to manifest things with a formula and how to manifest things from ideas into thoughts into things. We have a new movie that's come out right now called How Thoughts Become Things. It's, it's a sequel to The Secret. It's going gangbusters. And, and it's, I explain the principles of that. I show how to, how to get clear about what your mission is. Your mission is an expression of what you value most and it, how to put that together and start building that so you have something you're dedicated to in your life. Because people that are clear in what they're committed to go farther. And, and, I, and it's just the, the Q&A is all through it. So there's whatever comes up in your life, we show you how to break through those. And it's a very powerful, oh, 24, 25 hours or so together uh, on the weekend. And I, and I love doing it. I do it. I've done it since the coronavirus. I've done it, I think, seven times now. And um, I've taught all, a number of programs. Every week, I'm doing it pretty well. This week, I'm, I'm, I think I'm in London. or I'm doing it in that time zone or whatever. I'll be getting up at 2 o'clock here in Houston to start that one. But uh, I'm absolutely certain that it can make a difference. And what, what, what inspires me when you, you, you'll get in the, in the, the program online, we're going to be interacting with you live on the program and uh, solving problems as we go and going and go through examples. And you're going to see a lot by interactions of the people and my own interactions with you. And uh, it's, it's just an inspiring weekend. That's all I can say. It's not for people that want to rah-rah. So if you're going to stand up on chairs and, and sing and go kum gai or whatever and, and rah-rah-rah with music and stuff like that, this is not a herd a cattle rattle, a rustling kind of thing. This is not a rah-rah feel good kind of thing, none of that. This is a, for people who wanna master their life, for people who wanna go and empower the seven areas of life, it's, it's standing on my shoulders that I've been doing for 47, going on 48 years, 48 years in November of, of working on doing whatever I can to learn about human behavior given to you. And I want you, my life started out, believe it or not, <laughs> People go, well, you know, you have a different life today, but I actually remember a time when I used to go into diners and look for food sitting on people's uh, seats and, and scarfing food before they would tell me I got to leave the place. 
And I know what it's like to eat saltine crackers and ketchup for dinner. And I've lived on the streets and I've lived on, on an alley before. I know what it's like to have nothing and do what to do and try to go and panhandle for the, for the day on the street. I also know what it's like to live an amazing life. And, uh, and, and, and I'm absolutely certain that if, if I can do these things, there's no reason why anybody else can't do it. I didn't even have the ability to read until I was 18 years old. So it's nothing to do with where you come from, where you're going through, what you've been through. What matters is are you willing to apply the principles and methodology that have proven themselves to work to help you expand the seven areas of life? That's what breakthroughs for. It's for people that want to break through, that want to become leaders and self-mastered individuals, that don't want to go and look for immediate gratifications and fixes and highs and, and go for the sensationalism and be a spectator around other heroes, collective heroes. And I want them to be the ones that are going to be heroes within. They want to go out and do something. They want to tackle their responsibilities, be accountable, uh, be willing to learn, willing to find out what's really meaningful to them and go out and do something to serve somebody so you have real fulfillment in life. Uh, pursuit of money without meaning leads to debauchery, but with meaning, it leads to philanthropy and a contribution to the planet. And I know that deep inside, I've asked thousands of millions of people, even in prisons, I've asked them, I've asked them, and people want to make a difference in the world. And there's no reason why you can't make a difference in the world. And the breakthrough experience is about that. It's about helping people break through whatever they perceive that's in their way onto going on to do something that's meaningful to life. And I love doing it. I've been doing it, like I say, 1,100 times. And people think I'm kind of crazy because I do it every almost every week. But if you saw what I saw in the programs and saw the changes in people's lives and heard the thank yous at the end, you do the same thing I'd be doing. I, I, have, I have many, many uh, students that have been with me for many, many years. One is 47 years now. And uh, they, 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 they'll come back to the breakthrough experience many times and go, why would you come back? I said, because just being around and being reminded of the principles and being inspired by it and, and using the method on new things that I'm now facing in my life uh, is very powerful. And they just want to, they just want to go in and they want to take their life to the next level. I've seen people that are already extremely wealthy go in there and take new dimensions with it, do something more philanthropic. I've seen people that are just starting out that are young, very young and wanting to get a clarity and starting out and getting an advantage that most people don't do. I've seen almost every man, I've seen relationships that are almost on the blink, how to finally learn how to communicate and effectively so they can salvage and rebuild their relationship. I've seen people that in businesses that are sitting there under legal issues, how to dissolve the legal issues because they are learn the method on how to dissolve the conflict and it somehow just poofs and changes. So, I mean, there's so many applications to what I'm gonna be sharing in there that it's insane not to get exposed to it. I wish most everybody on the planet would get it. I think it needs to be in this friggin' school so the kids get it away because so much information is so, it, it direct the Paul, Nobel Prize winner said, it's not that we don't know so much, we know so much that isn't so. We know so much that isn't so. And there's so many friggin' false myths out there that are sold as opium to the masses that people don't even know that there's a deeper truth, a hidden order in the parent chaos. And that's what I'm, I wanna bring in that breakthrough experience. I want people to know that that's that because I want them to know something magnificent. There is a magnificence inside the world and inside you that you may not even have gotten to know. And I know that if the principles are applied, you get to find out about it and you get to use it and you get to appreciate the world. There's no reason why anything you can't say thank you for in your life is baggage. Anything you can't say thank you for is fuel. I got interviewed this week and somebody said, well, what are your regrets? I don't have regrets. I, every single thing that goes in my life has been part of my mission. And you wanna be able to come from life, the idea that you're not waking up at the end of your life with Bonnie Ware's regrets. So if you're wanting to break through and go to another level and do something with your life, please consider coming to break to experience. I wanna help you do What's it's done for me. So anyway, I could go on for hours on that. I just start to warm up on that. Now, thank you for that, Dr. Martini. And one of the great opportunities of what's happening globally now is that you can attend the Breakthrough Experience online with Dr. Martini. And what we've done is we've put a great package together for you um, where you get the Breakthrough Experience online and you also get Dr. Martini's signature um, program, Inspired Destiny Online as well, um, that you will be able to um, work through after you've attended the Breakthrough Experience also. And if you click on this offer, you'll see um, it's demartini.inc forward slash mindset. It will take you through to the landing page. You'll see there's a few um, time zones that you can attend. Um, it is a live program, so it is um, um, specific to a date, but you can just click on the, on, on the time zone that will suit you. You can come in from anywhere in the world. 
And we look forward to having you on the um, Breakthrough Experience online. You'll see when you click through on the offer, you're also going to get a 60% or close to a 60% discount on the offer. So please go make sure um, that you have a look at that and that you can join us uh, with the Breakthrough Experience online. Uh, Dr. Di Martini, do you have any last words for us? Yeah, first of all, thank you, Emil, for, for again, coordinating and asking questions and things. And just, you want to give yourself permission as a human being to, de de to design your life. Live by design, not duty. Live by taking command of your own decisions of what you want. Because if you don't get up in the morning and dedicate your life to something that's inspiring to you, you're going to end up being told what to do. And there's no reason why you have to live by other people's expectations all the time. You want to serve people, but you want to serve the people you want to target with the things that you love doing. There's absolutely no reason why you can't live an inspired life. And I, I'm absolutely certain that there's principles you can do it. And I know the breakthrough experience can help you do it. So please uh, join me for that because I know I can help you do something more amazing with your life. My life has been so transformed by learning these principles over the last 47 years. And to me to go to the grave and not share those would be insane. So come join me and um, look forward to seeing you in, on the line or in person, wherever we happen to meet. Thank you, Mil. Uh, thank, thank you all. for that, Dr. Di Martini. And for those that have joined us on this lifetime, thank you very much for uh, spending this uh, hour and or 45 minutes with us. Um, we lo really look forward to having you on the Breakthrough Experience online. If you do have any further questions, you can also go to Dr. Di Martini's website, drdmartini.com. We always have somebody online that you can um, interact with us on the, if you do have any further questions. But we, we really look forward to having you on the Breakthrough Experience online. And Dr. Di Martini, thank you again for your time. And until we see yep. you next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today. If you found value out of the presentation, please go below and please share your comments. We certainly appreciate that feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icons. That way I can bring more content to you and share more to help you maximize your life. I look forward to our next presentation. Thank you so much for joining me.